All right, physics. So, um, in the Stingray Onion, we use the uh, physics, physics, physics simulator, or physics onion, uh, which is which is being developed by Nvidia, and it provides uh, the normal things you would expect from a physics onion, uh, things like rigid body simulation, simulating various characters, uh, various shapes uh, interacting and bouncing off each other and so on. Joints, so that's, that's uh, sh joints or constraints are, are shapes linked to other shapes in various ways. Uh, you can have a, a hinge joint that rotates like this, a ball and socket joint which allows um, more rotation and all kinds of ways of connecting physics bodies together into more complicated systems. Um, ray costs, we can cast a ray into the physics world and see if it hits something, typically used for, for bullets or for AI queries and so on. Uh, other shape queries than ray costs, you can, for example, uh, say, give me a list of all the physics objects that touch this sphere or that touch this uh, box. Uh, or move this sphere from here to here and tell me any physics objects that it will intersect on its path. Those kind of queries. Um, triggers. A trigger is a, a physics shape that will generate a callback whenever something touches it. So you can create a box that reacts whenever a character walks into it. Um, character controllers. Uh, which we, in our engine, we call them movers as well. Uh, so these are, these are the things that you would use to, to move a character around in the physics world. Uh, when, when a character walks around, you want it to have reasonable behavior with respect to the, to the physics uh, objects in the world. So it shouldn't walk through walls, it should, it should walk on the ground. If the ground slopes up or down, it should walk on that naturally. It should be able to walk upstairs, maybe. Uh, so a lot of things uh, connected to how a how a character or or an AI uh, person moves about in the world. Um, vehicles, which are treated as kind of a special case, um, as they as they have special properties. Uh, and cloth simulation is another thing we also have support for. So these are all the things provided by the physics engine and we provide interfaces into those systems uh, in Stingray. So I, if, you, if you look at the physics code in the engine, um, this is another case of where the the structure of the of the header files and the CPP files is a bit weird uh, because we have, on the one hand, we have an object called Physics World, uh, and then we have uh, something called Physics World Internal, which is the implementation of the interface in in Physics World. Uh, so this is a bit confusing, and and again, this is. Um, I talked about um, code being weirdly organized because of PS3 SPUs before. And this is another case where, where the code is kind of weirdly organized uh, for a reason that's no longer really valid. Uh, the way we organized this, the code this way was that in the beginning when we started working on physics, we had the idea of supporting multiple physics backends. So, so physics and maybe Havoc and Bullet 2 or uh, whatever other physics engine you might want to imagine. So we try to sort of divide the interface into uh, sort of generic header classes that could be used with any physics backend and then different implementations that uh, implemented this generic interface using physics or using Havoc or something else, for instance. And the idea was that using a compiler switch, you could then switch between different physics backends. Um, 
Now it turned out we never actually implemented any other uh, physics backend than physics. Uh, so we never really used this division. And also, as always happens when you have like this, uh, this kind of abstraction, but nothing that really enforces it, what tends to happen over time is that uh, the abstraction becomes a bit leaky. So concepts that are really physics specific uh, or ideas that are physics specific tend to over time leak from the sort of implementation part into the abstract interface part. So probably, probably now this, this sort of distinction makes even less sense because probably I haven't, I haven't checked this out in detail. I'm just speculating now based on how I, how I know that these things go over time. So probably what has happened is that some physics details have leaked into these interfaces that were supposed to be abstract and not, uh, not, physic, not dependent on the actual phys physics implementation. Uh, so probably today it makes even, even less sense to have these, these, uh, this distinction. Now what, we, what, what I think we would really want is to have the physics system as a plugin when, when we wrote the physics system, uh, the physics system was written way before we had the plugin system. And so that's why it wasn't implemented as a plugin because that's, that's how we usually do it today when we want to have like different backends uh, supporting the same interface. We, we make an abstract interface and then the, the backends are just plugins. And I think that would be uh, a much better way of organizing this. So this is, uh, this whole system is kind of ripe for refactoring uh, in like two stages. You could say one stage of refactoring would be to to do away with this uh, this sort of abstraction that doesn't make sense anymore. To have uh, have the files sort of split up into the implementation part and the interface part when when it's just the same. Uh, we only have a single implementation, so these could be merged into. Uh, single interface which would make the code easier to read. That's like one level of, of abstraction that's that would improve the code layout. And the next level of abstraction, which would be even, even better, would be to break all of this out into a plugin instead. Uh, but that's a bit of a bigger task. But that would make it possible to support Havoc or Bullet or uh, whatever else uh, in, in an easier way. Uh, so that's something to think about for the future. Um, in this session, I won't go too much into, there's a lot to be said about physics simulation in general, about how physics simulation work, what are the kinds of shapes that are supported, what, what kind of performance do we get, what's, what are stability issues and so on. And you could spend hours and hours talking just about that. So I won't go that much into that. I'll try to focus on our implementation of physics, how, what's specific to our code. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the most common sort of um, general physics issues that you can run into at the end of this talk, but that's just a really short overview. Uh, if you want to learn more about general physics engine issues, you should read the documentation for some physics engine and, and some physics engine forums and stuff like that you can find. Uh, find more information about those stuff. So, uh, for setting up physics objects, for, for sort of configuring physics, uh, we have multiple ways of doing that in the Onion. Um, the first one is to do it in the unit editor, uh, where you edit units. Uh, so, in the unit editor, you can select a graphical mesh uh, that has been created by the DCC tool and export it to an FBX file. And you can say that this mesh should have physics. We should create a physics actor based on, based on this particular mesh. And when you do that, you can also select um, the type of shape that should be used for the mesh. So you can say that it should be a sphere or a capsule or a box uh, or a mesh like representing the full mesh, uh, the full graphics mesh, or a convex object. And the shape type you select will be fitted so that it fits uh, 
the shape of, of the graphics mesh that you've, that you've chosen to add an actor for. So if you selected a capsule shape, it'll try to fit the capsule shape to that uh, graphical shape that you, that you have. And you can either do this, you can either do this for existing graphic objects. So if you have a, a graphic, uh, a graphic uh, mesh for a chest, for example, in, in, in a unit, you can select that graphics mesh to have physics and pick a suitable physics object for it. Or you might have made, in the DCC tool, you might have made a custom shape, uh, a custom mesh, which is just for the physics. So you might have made a simpler shape because you don't want to have as many vertices in the physics or whatever. And in that case, you would select that shape to have physics and then you would disable rendering for that shape. So that shape would only exist as a, as a physics shape. Um, you, also, you also select what properties uh, your physics object should have. Uh, things like uh, friction, uh, restitution, which is like bounciness of the object, um, mass, other stuff like that, typical physics properties. Uh, one of the properties is also the kind of simulation you want and there are three kinds uh, there are kinematic or keyframed means that the object is uh, object is animated it is controlled by the engine uh, but you want it reflected into the physics so you might have an animated platform for instance uh, but that platform should push physics object around so it needs to be it needs to be, be it needs to exist in the physics world but it's not pushed around by the physics world it's just follows the animation 100 percent and pushes physics around another common example of this is uh, hit boxes for characters typically if you have a character in the game you uh, if it's if it's gunplay based game uh, you need something to ray cast against when someone tries to hit the character so typically you put some uh, some boxes for representing the overall shape of the character uh, into the physics world so that you can do ray cost and see if you if you hit that character or not and since the character is animated uh, those hit boxes will be kinematic or keyframe they will follow the animation of the character they won't do anything in the physics world on on their own uh, then there are dynamic uh, physics objects, which means that they are simulated, they are <clears throat> reacting to whatever happens in the physics world. They are pushed around by forces, by collisions with other physics objects, and so on. And the third category is static physics objects. Uh, those are objects that never move, like maybe your basic floor plan of your level that just consists of static objects, they will never move. And static objects are, are the most efficient since they never move we can do a lot less simulation for them kinematic are more expensive and the dynamic ones are are the most expensive uh, sometimes when you when you think about this you you might want to uh, you might think about having objects that are kind of both kinematic and and uh, and dynamic like well i want my player i want my the leg of my player to to be kinematic because or keyframe because it should follow when the player is running uh, the leg should follow but of course if the player runs into something if the player runs into a physics object uh, then the leg should stop because it hits that physics object uh, so i want it to be kind of both keyframed and dynamic and if you if you start to go into that territory it's easy to get yourself super confused because it's uh, you get into the problem, well, who is actually in control here? And in the end, you need, you need to sort of decide who is actually in control. Is it, well, is it the animation that's in control or, uh, or is it the physics? Because if it's the physics, then that could mean that, well, maybe your leg gets stuck behind the box and the rest of the character moves on, controlled by the animation. Uh, then you will just have a leg left, some, left behind in the level and that will, will look super strange. So, um, so you really need to think about if you want that kind of interaction between uh, animation and physics, you really need to think about how that's 
going to work. Uh, but to keep things clear in your head, you should consider objects to be either kinematic or dynamic. They are either driven by animation or they're driven by physics. Uh, now you could make something that's physics driven but sort of constrained to an animation to get sort of a, a mix of both, both words. But when you think, think of an individual object, you should think of it as, as having a clear owner. It's, it's something that controls the position of this object and it can't be two things because uh, then it gets confusing. Um, so these, these properties that an object has, um, they are defined in a global file which enumerates the physics properties and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, anyway, if, if you're setting up the physics in the unit editor, um, it will create a .physics file next to the .unit file and that .physics file will contain all the physics settings for that unit. Um, another way you could set it up is using the physics plugin for Maya. So the physics plugin allows you to set up shapes, uh, joints and constraints from within Maya and then you can export that and use it in the engine. It should be noted that in the unit editor we don't have any constraint editor. So in the unit editor you can only set up simple shapes. Uh, you, we don't have any way of, of configuring constraints between the shapes uh, from within the unit editor. Uh, so if you need constraints, for example if you're setting up a ragdoll, uh, then you need to do it uh, using the physics plugin in Maya. Um, the physics plugin doesn't have any knowledge of our our global physics properties files, the ones we, uh, because that only exists in the engine and the plugin is not engine specific, that's a generic physics plugin for, for creating physics objects, not, not something specific to the Stingray. So, so it doesn't know about these properties, so if you want to, if you want to give uh, the objects that you created using this plugin, if you're going to give them properties, like specifying whether they should be kinematic and, and connecting them to our property system, you have to do that map in the unit editor. So in the unit editor you would go into uh, these shapes uh, created by the physics plugin and say that they should have specific properties. And uh, these uh, setups that you do with a physics plugin, uh, they are exported in a .physics file, uh, which ends up next to the unit. Um, a third way is to do it manually from the script. So from the script you can spawn a physics sphere, spawn other kinds of physics objects um, if you need to create something completely dynamically. Uh, and finally for cloth, cloth has a special editor. Uh, so that's, that's another editor which also exists as a Maya plugin. And the cloth editor will, will export yet another file format called .apx, which is where your cloth files will live. So there's not numerous ways of setting up the physics objects. Um, the physics properties, as I said, they're specified in a global file for the project. At least all the, all the different kinds of shapes and all the different kinds of uh, materials that we have in the engine. Uh, and it looks can look something like this. It has a list of materials. Um, this, in this example we only have one material. Um, we specify its density, friction, restitution. Uh, we could add more materials. This one has the same density as water, so that's like a generic d density for water and meat and similar kinds of objects that have similar density to water. Uh, we could add, if we wanted to support like iron or stuff with, with higher density, we would add more materials here. Um, then we have a section defining which ob objects collide with which other objects. Um, so we first have collision types, which are classes of collision objects, and these, acts, these sort of acts as a bit mask. So an, act, an, an object can have a combination of these types. Uh, so an object could be both a character and a pickup, for instance, if for some special objects. And these 
collision filters define sort of these masks. So a collision filter uh, lists all the types that this object is. So in this case, this type is a default object. This one is a character. Uh, we could create another one that that was both a character and default object by, by listing them both here if we wanted to. Uh, and then it also lists objects of this type, which object do they collide with? And you can either do that by explicitly listing the objects and the types it collides with, or by, or by listing uh, the types it doesn't collide with. So this collides with everything except the character type, and this one just collides with the character type. So each, when you create an actor, uh, you will give it a type that is one of these collision filters. And that will specify how that actor collides with other actors. Uh, and and uh, it's enough if one of these, so you see the character doesn't explicitly, uh, the character doesn't explicitly say that it collides with this character trigger, but it's enough that one of them says that this one says that it collides with that one. So that's, that's enough. Um, then it also has uh, properties for shapes. So whenever you set up a shape in the unit editor, you will give it one of these shape types and that will specify what kind of shape it is. Uh, we can disable collisions, for example, disable ray casting for it and so on. Uh, and also we will give it an actor type and the actor type specifies whether it's dynamic or kinematic or static and it also specifies damping and so on. So multiple ways of setting up properties. So one thing you might ask with this property system is why do we, why do we have this centralized place to specify properties? Why don't we just uh, why don't you just, when you set up the actor, why don't you say, well, this actor has this linear damping, the actor has this friction, like in the unit editor when you set it up, it's, it should have this friction, it should have this damping, uh, and so on. Why do we put it all in a centralized location instead and, and then reference into this centralized location? Um, well, there are two main reasons for that. One is that it makes it easier, by having everything in a central location, it makes it kind of easier to tune behavior. Uh, so if you see that, uh, oh, it seems like my, it seems like my objects are sliding around a bit too much, I, I should increase the friction, then you can just go into the central file and increase the friction uh, for all the objects and see how that behaves. Uh, if we didn't have the central file, then we'd have to go into each and every object and change the friction uh, friction of that object, which would be kind of tedious. And I would say this is sort of a this is sort of a general design issue that tends to that tends to crop up again and again in an engine. It's something I've seen I've seen multiple times. Like, should you put it's just like a general design philosophy question. Should you put things, should you put configurations and properties directly into the objects or you, should you put them into templates and then link the objects to templates so that you can then modify the templates. And there are advantages and disadvantages of both, of both kinds here. The sort of the template model makes it easier to change things for, for multiple uh, multiple related things at the same time. Uh, so it's easier to do this. It's, it's sort of a clearer structure to change those things. On the other hand, it, it adds a layer of indirection and in that way, complexity to the system. Uh, it makes the UI more complex because if you're going to show this in the UI, you sort of have to distinguish between, uh, oh, this is a this is a value that is set on this object or this is an inherited value from the template uh, and it becomes more complicated for the users to to reason about templates and templated things and inheritance between things so i think this is 
this is one of the one of the points where it sort of uh, sort of becomes um, a distinction between uh, beginning users and and more power users. I think for power users, they definitely prefer these being able to create kind of these templates and and order create more orderly thoughts about the world in that way by creating hierarchies of objects with with templates that are inherited while as for beginners that that whole thing might just create confusion it might be easier to just see well i'm just setting the properties of of this object um, but that's just a general thing and and the reason we've done it this, this especially for physics that's kind of a a reaction to to what we saw in previous engines uh, because what we saw in in previous engines was that uh, artists who were the ones sort of setting up the physics of objects weren't very good in, in at specifying good physics properties for objects so uh, we would often see things like well here is a football it weighs um, it weighs 1000 kilograms or something like that uh, just lots of lots and lots of physics values that didn't really make sense. Um, so I think that was what kind of led to the idea that well, well, we can't really expect individual artists to do proper physics setup of objects. Uh, we should just move that responsibility into a more centralized place where a single tech artist can go through all the physics setup and see well this actually makes sense from a physical perspective. So I think it was that kind of uh, that kind of thought that led us to to do this to specifically for physics make sure that we have everything centralized like this. Uh, so that's one reason, but there's another reason too, and that's that physics uh, in itself only supports a limited number of collision types uh, because these collision filters end up as bit masks, and these bit masks have a fi fixed width. So we can actually only support 64 different kind of collision types. And if we had the collision types uh, stored for each object, that, that becomes kind of hard to control how many different collision types we have and, and what are the collision types really. Uh, in, in a filter, you want to specify what other objects I can collide with. But if the collision types are like spread out in all different kinds of objects, you might not even even know which other collision types exist and it becomes kind of confusing to create this uh, collision mask that should specify what you should collide with. Uh, so that's the other reason. Uh, but there are big disadvantages to having this centralized system. Uh, the most important one is that units are now no longer self-contained. So uh, a unit does not only depend on what's specified in the .unit file and the .fpx and, and all the other files that are packaged together with the unit. The unit also depends on the settings in this global file. And if we copy unit files between projects, uh, they will typically break, either because they will specify physics properties or, or physics shape types or actor types that doesn't exist in the other object, uh, in the other project and then they don't mean anything or they will uh, might exist in the other project but they have different settings in that project so now the unit will behave differently so so it's not a very good solution from that perspective because it kind of breaks moving units between projects which is something very useful and something we would really like to do so i think it might be better to actually have this um, stored in each unit like locally not have this global file uh, and then for for collision uh, for the collision types it's not that simple because we we still need to have somehow a centralized list of collision types um, just so that we can specify the filters in 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 some way uh, so maybe maybe the collision types should be files like this it should it could be just an empty file um, that defines the collision type and then um, uh, then that file would be a dependency of the unit if the unit used the specific collision type that file would be a dependency so if we exported the unit we would get this collision type together with the unit 
and then when we imported it into another project, um, that collision type would follow with the unit inside the project, so it, it would still kind of work. Of course, if that's a collision type that doesn't exist in the other project, we still have to do something about these filters. I mean, if I if I copy uh, if I copy uh, something that has a new collision type floor that this product doesn't know about, we either need to change the collision type of that object or we need to specify how all these things would collide with the new floor type. So there's there is no way of doing this like completely seamlessly, uh, like copying units between projects because since this collision physics collision thing is sort of a n squared map between uh, between different things um, there's no way of doing this completely transparently uh, we have to have some patch but i think we could do a better job than today by sort of uh, by breaking it up uh, like this rather than having this global file well that's kind of a sidetrack but yeah i kind of explained already how these collision filters work um, one final thing to note is that they are they're used for object to object collisions but they are also used for all other kinds of queries like ray costs and shape queries so when you do a ray cost for instance you would say well this ray cost uh, has this trigger so it should uh, it should collide with uh, it should find these objects um, so physics world, uh, that's the class that represents a world in, in the physics. It, we have one physics world for each game world. So each world we create in the game where our game objects live, we have a corresponding physics world where physics actors live. And the physics world has functions for uh, creating objects, so we can create objects in these various kinds of ways. Uh, all these different kinds of ways we supported of creating objects. And it has functions for creating joints as well, creating movers, character controllers, cloth, all the different kinds of objects we support. Uh, and then it has support for these kinds of queries, so Raycast queries, Overlap queries, these test if one shape overlaps any actors in the scene. Uh, sweep queries, uh, they are like ray costs, but instead of costing a single point into a ray, they cost them a shape, like a sphere shape or a capsule shape, and sweep that through the scene and see what they collide with. Uh, and then just query functions for accessing all the actors, all the movers, and so on. Uh, and an update function, of course, for updating the physics world and performing the, the simulation. Um, as I said, the, the physics objects need to be connected to the world objects. Um, these are, we have two separate worlds, one representing our game objects, one representing our physics objects, but they need to be connected because when a, a platform moves in the world, the corresponding platform should move in physics. And if a ball rolls around in the physics world, we want the corresponding uh, shape in, in the game world to roll around and, and show the same behavior. Uh, so this connection is mediated by the actor-connector clause. Um, so that looks something like this. Uh, so it's connected to, to a node in the scene graph of the unit. Uh, so that's the node that corresponds to to the shape of the of the actor. So for the rolling ball, it would correspond to the node where the graphics object for the ball is attached. So that when the physics ball rolls, the graphic ball will also roll. And then it has some functions here for doing things with this uh, with this actor, adding velocity, pushing it around, teleporting it, and so on. And there are there are corresponding there are corresponding classes. There's like a joint connector for for talking to joints and a vehicle connector for talking to vehicles and so on. Um, 
the physics world keeps a, keeps track of all the key framed actors that are awake and at the start of at the start of the update when the physics world is updated it will read out the positions from the engine so that's how the keyframe keyframe values get in um, so for this animated platform at the start of the physics simulation it will read the position from the game world and update the position of the physics object to that position uh, and the opposite end of that writing out the result uh, like when we simulate in physics and this rolling ball has rolled a little bit we need to get that back in the world and we do that uh, through the world object it keeps track of all the moving uh, actors that are simulated in the physics world and after we've updated, update, updated the physics part uh, the world will read back these physics position into the units into the game objects so that the graphic objects will get the corresponding movement so that looks something like this uh, here uh, update physics where it goes through all these all these moving objects and write the physics positions into the units and it keeps track of of which of these were dirty too because we need that to reflect the positions later to the render thread um, one important thing to note here is that we we take a lot of trouble so that we don't update all the objects in the world because uh, we want to make sure that the cost we're paying for this is proportional not to the total number of objects but only to the number of objects that move that is like the best we can do because for all the objects that move we need to do something in order to to reflect the position but we shouldn't pay the cost for for all the objects that don't move so if we have a hundred thousand objects uh, in the scene but only 10 of them move the cost we pay should be proportional to 10 and not to a hundred thousand i think that's an important principle that we try to follow everywhere in the engine that you shouldn't pay a cost for for the stuff that doesn't do anything so we have some code that keeps track of which objects are are actually moving and make sure we have like lists of just those objects so that we can limit the update to those and we'll see a bit more when we i have a talk where i go into the how the world is set up and the units and we'll see a little bit more on that in in that talk how we actually do that um, there is some additional complexity if you start to look into the details of, of how these positions are copied back and forth between the world and the physics world there is some additional complexity there to handle complicated situations because we can have pretty complicated situations we can have uh, we can have a keyframed object um, that is linked to a dynamic object that's linked in the scene graph in the game world it's linked to a dynamic object so if you have this rolling ball uh, we might have linked another unit uh, on that ball that should follow when the ball rolls uh, and that might be a keyframe physics object so we want to get that object's position into the physics as well and uh, the dynamic object the ball might be jointed to another to another physics object so we might have a keyframe platform that moves up and down and then we have a ball hanging from it uh, which is simulated but it hangs from that keyframed object with a joint and then we may have another keyframe object linked to that ball so we might have complicated i mean the, this we could have as many levels as possible here we could have an arbitrary number of levels and one important thing to notice is that we can't fully simulate this because and because the physics simulation that is done as one incremental step where we update all the dynamic physics uh, and that means that uh, we can't get uh, the keyframed objects that's if we have this situation where we have a keyframe platform a ball hanging from it and a keyframe object on the ball uh, we do our first update we update this keyframe platform into the physics world so it ends up somewhere here in the physics world and then we do the 
the simulation of this dynamic object and it ends up here. But during that simulation, uh, the keyframe object that's attached to the ball will be in the wrong position because the ball hasn't updated yet. So we don't know where this keyframe object that sits on the ball should be. So in the physics world, the keyframe object of the ball will still be here. Then we do the physics simulation. Uh, this dynamic object will end up here. The keyframe object of the here linked to that object is still here. Then we do another pass where we write out the simulation and we will update the position of the linked object. So we will move uh, 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 the graphics for the keyframe object will move here since it's linked to the physics object. But during the simulation, uh, this keyframe object that was attached to the ball was kind of lagging one frame. And that will always happen in this kind of, it's, there's no way to avoid this. Like since we have a single physics update, we can't get the keyframe objects that are dependent on the positions of dynamic objects. We can't get them in the right place until we've done the update and actually move the dynamic objects. So, so this frame delay sort of has to happen. We are forced to have that frame delay in the physics. Uh, but we want, to, we want the impact of that to be as nice as possible. So we want to make sure that, uh, that we do an update of this keyframe. Even though this is a keyframed object, it needs to be updated after the physics update because it's linked to a physics object uh, that was moved as part of the physics object. So, so when you see sort of these these extra updates in the code, that's for taking care of those kinds of situations. So it, it won't fix that, the, that this keyframe object is in the wrong position for the physics simulation, but in the graphics afterwards, it will be in the right place because it will do uh, an extra update to make sure it's uh, repositioned to follow the dynamic object it's linked to. Uh, this can be a bit complicated to think about in your head. So if, if you get into this situation, you can sit down and think about it a bit more. I'm not sure it's how easy it is to follow the explanation when I just speak about it here. Um, one important topic when it comes to physics is, is time stepping. How do we step the time in the physics? As I said um, in a previous talk, in the end, we generally use a variable time step. So we step with as much time as we has. We measure how much time has passed, and that's the amount of time we step after some, some filtering and in this time step policy class, if you remember. Uh, but that's not really good for physics. Um, physics really likes to have a fixed time step. If you step physics with a variable time step, you tend to get unpredictable behavior and some physics objects like stacks and chains will behave differently depending on how long your time step is. And stepping with variable time steps can cause them to sort of jump around and, and behave strangely. So in physics, we really want to have a fixed time step. And uh, our model is we use a 60 hertz time step and we don't do any interpolation. Uh, so I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, now the actual in the in the real world in in the game world uh, it's not certain that one sixtieth of a second has passed it might be less it might be more so what we do in the physics is we take as many steps that we need uh, to keep up with this and this may cause a bit of jitter if you're looking at the uh, simulated physics objects because in some frames uh, we will take two simulation steps. Say, say that we're running at, at 45 hertz. So we're not running at 30, which would mean we will always take two steps in physics, and we're not running at 60, which would mean we would always take one step. Instead, we're in a situation where sometimes we'll take one step in physics on some frames, and on some frames we'll, step, we'll take two steps in physics. Uh, and this will cause quite a bit of, of jittery or strutty behavior. If you look at the if you look at the simulated objects, because it's sometimes in some frames it will take, even though the frames are of equal length, they're over 45 hertz, uh, the physics object will sometimes behave as, as if they took a longer frame and sometimes as if they took uh, a shorter frame. How noticeable this is can be sort of debated. Some people think it's very noticeable. Some people think it's not so noticeable. Uh, 
but this is this is the behavior we have in the onion uh, and there has been like discussions about or I've thought about uh, getting rid of this behavior and the typical thing you would do in an onion uh, in order to get rid of this behavior and get some something smoother is that you would interpolate the graphics position uh, between the physics time steps so what that what that would mean is that uh, you would still you would still do the physics update at 60 Hertz uh, but then you would look at, well, how much time um, do I have left in this frame, uh, which is a fraction of 60 hertz. And from that time, you would interpolate between uh, the physics position and the previous physics position. So if you're, if you're halfway uh, into the next frame, you would position the graphics object uh, halfway between these two physics um, simulated physics positions. And then you get rid of this uh, like one step, two step, you will always be taking like one and a half step uh, each frame. So, so this gets rid of that sort of stuttering behavior, uh, but it has other negative consequences. So the most serious of this is that uh, the physics position of objects will no longer match the visual position. So if you do this interpolation, you will have a graphic position interpolated between uh, the physic current physics position and the last physics position. So the graphics position will be here, but the actual physics position of the object will be here. Uh, so the graphics and the physics no longer match up. And this means, for example, that uh, ray costs will miss. Like if you shoot, if you shoot towards the graphics position, uh, you think that you would hit the object because you're seeing yourself hitting the object or this was the graphics position ah doesn't matter uh, you would think that you would hit the object because you're seeing yourself hitting the object but since the physical object is in a different position you wouldn't actually hit um, so you could argue well does this really matter because because the positions only differ uh, a lot when the object is moving quickly and at that if it's moving quickly, it's kind of hard to say whether you're hitting it uh, anyway. But there are situations where it definitely will matter. So one of those situations is, for example, if you have uh, if you have two cars running next to each other. So if you have like a kind of a car chase scene where one car is running, the other car runs up to that car, and they're now running next to each other, and you shoot from one car over to the other. Now now their cars now both cars are moving at a high speed but they're moving in sync so it's easy to aim from one car to another you can easily see into the other car and you can easily see oh i should hit uh, this person in the other car but since the, since the actual physics object is at a different position you won't actually hit that person in the other car in that case uh, you will hit something else when you do a rate cost in the physics um, Another situation where, where this can become very visible is if you have like a bullet time effect, like where, where, where you slow down time in the game, go into a slow motion mode. Now, if you go into a slow motion mode, um, it would be very, then it would take a really long time for, for the, uh, you, you would have these two physics position and in slow motion, the graphics would move really slowly from one, uh, from the old physics position to the new one and then if you were sort of aiming at the object in this sort of bullet time mode where it's moving really slowly you could aim directly at the object and you would say like oh I'm totally hitting this object right now I can totally aim at it and hit it but you wouldn't hit it because the physics object would be over here so that's another time where uh, where this can lead to trouble um, you can maybe get around these ray cost issues by by doing different updates by by keeping the ray cost world separate from the from the simulation world and doing the ray cost world uh, updating the ray cost world not with fixed time steps but with variable time steps and reflect sort of the the graphics position in the ray cost world but having a separate simulation world uh, where you uh, where you step with fixed time steps, but it kind of gets more complicated. 
And another issue that isn't really fixed by that is that uh, when physics and graphics no longer match up, that means that your character will be able to penetrate the graphics. So if you have uh, the graphics here and the physics over here, and you have a character running up against the object, uh, the, character, the character will uh, test against the physics word, so it will run sort of through the, through the graphics part uh, over and collide stop when it reaches the physics part here. And that might mean that your character can penetrate into the graphics world. It might even allow your camera to go through, um, go through the graphics object so you can see through the object, which is kind of bad behavior. So, so in conclusion, there are, I'm, there are a bunch of problems with interpolating physics too. So I, I'm not sure I would want to completely switch the engine over to interpolating physics or interpolating between the physics frames. But I'm thinking maybe we need to support both. So maybe we need to have a flag somewhere in our settings that says uh, we should interpolate physics between frames, uh, or interpolate graphics between physics frames, or no, we should follow exact uh, the physics position. And then the, uh, the game developer can sort of decide based on the requirements of their specific project if they want to what kind of errors they're willing to tolerate, if they prefer to have this sort of jitter or stutter effect, or if they prefer to have uh, this situation where ray costs can miss and characters can penetrate in some circumstances. So I think that would probably be the right way to go with this. Um, so some other issues with the time step. Uh, what if the time step, any time step is really long? What if like there is a, a hitch in the frame so that the ending time step is really long. Well, we don't want to, in that case, we don't want to take a large number of physics steps uh, because that can cause a thing called spiral of death, which means that uh, if we say that the ending time, say we get a hitch, so uh, the ending time turns out to be one second, well, then we take, need to take 60, physics, 60 steps in the physics. So we take 60 steps in the physics, but maybe that takes a really long time, simulating 60 steps in the physics. So maybe the, the time for the next frame turns out to be two seconds because it took so long to simulate all that physics. Well, then we determine, oh, now I have to take 120 steps in the physics. Then we do that, and then it takes even longer, and so on. Uh, so we need to put a cap on the number of steps we take uh, in order to avoid this sort of downward spiral where each frame just takes longer and longer uh, until until the game is unplayable. Uh, so we have a limit on the number of steps set to something like five or something. I don't know what, what the default is. You can change it, but it has some default setting. Uh, what this means in practice is that if the game is running, if the game is running in low frame rate for some situation, if you have a lot of graphics or more than the engine can handle, uh, the physics will sort of go into a slow motion mode because we will take fewer steps in physics than the time that has actually passed. And the effect of that will be that less time happens in the physics world, so the physics world was, will kind of slow-mo. So this is kind of similar to what you would see in, in like old Nintendo games, like you shoot a lot of bullets and the whole game goes into slow motion. It's kind of a similar thing, but just apply the physics in this case. Um, Another situation, so this time stepping is kind of more complicated than you would initially think. Uh, but another situation that can happen is what if the Indian time step is really short? And the typical case is, as I mentioned above, if, is if you have bullet time or slow motion, uh, uh, a bullet time or slow motion effect. So uh, if we did that, if we stepped down and went into real slow motion mode, um, since we, if we continue to step the physics engine at 60 hertz in slow motion, then what you would see is uh, you would see the object in its place for one frame for a long, long time. Since, since we have slowed down time, uh, this 60 hertz step that we're stepping the physics at takes a really long time. So we'd see the object in one place for a long, long time and then would jump to its next position and be there for a long, long time, and then jump to its next position. So that would look really, really bad. The object would kind of 
snap between these, these places. Um, so what we do in the ending is that if we detect that we're in this situation, if we're running at a really short time step, if we're going into a slow motion mo mode, we will actually start taking smaller time steps in physics. So we will no longer step, step at a fixed rate. Now, typically this is, uh, as I said, you typically want to take fixed time steps in physics. Uh, taking smaller time steps is better than taking longer time steps. It usually uh, leads to better behavior, but it's not 100% certain. It might cause your engine to, it might cause the physics to behave a bit weirdly. Uh, so this is another, another factor to put into this equation, like when sh whether you should run uh, interpolated or not, because in interpolated mode, of course, you, could, you would get a smooth motion, even if we were running in slow motion. Uh, now with this, you will get a smooth motion, with smaller time steps, you will get a, a smooth motion, but you might notice an object that is resting, like a stack of objects that is resting, might suddenly move a little bit because the, uh, the change in time step changes sort of the, uh, the equations for the constraints between these objects and they might change their behavior a bit. So, yeah, as I said, I, I don't think what we're doing now is the right choice for every game, so I think we should... Oh, uh, oh yeah, most of these things are currently configurable in, in, in the settings file. The only thing that's not configurable right now is interpolation. We don't have support for that yet. But that's something I think we should add, and I think we should add that to the configuration files. You can select whether you want to run interpolate or not. Um, the mover, uh, as I said before, that's the character controller that determines how characters move around in, in the world. And we're actually using our own mover for this. Uh, there is one in physics. We've sort of borrowed ideas for the, from the one in physics, but implemented it on ourselves to have better control of it. And the way it works it's not very complicated. It will, for each character that's moving around in the world, it will take a box that is bigger than the characters with, with some extra margin, and it will extract all the shapes uh, from the physics world in this box into a cache for more efficient performance. So all the triangles, all the spheres, all the capsules, meshes are broken down into triangles, and the individual triangles that intersect this box go into the cache. And then, and then we just do capsule sweeps within this cache uh, for, for checking whether this uh, capsule character can move, uh, uh, whether it collides with everything when moving around here. And when the character gets to the ed edge of the cache, we'll bring in a new cache. So we'll bring in a new set of triangles and spheres and capsules and then collide, uh, collide against those. But by keeping the cache local, uh, we can improve the performance a lot compared to just doing uh, if we did like capsule sweeps in the full physics world. So the cache is sort of an optimization for, for getting faster, faster sweeps in a localized context. So there's an interface to the mover, uh, uh, which which should maybe be called mover connector, like if it to be consistent with actor connector and so on. Uh, but that allows you to send in positions how you want the, the mover to move, and you can query it for its position. So you send, you send an, an argument, I want to move this mover like over here, and then the mover is simulated and it collides with something, and then you can query its position and say, no, it actually ended up over here because it collided with, with this thing. And you can query things like, is the mover standing on something? Like is it standing on solid ground or is it flying around? Is it colliding with anything? If it's standing on something, what's the slope of the thing it's standing on and so on. Uh, and, and the mover class uh, talks to this lower level sweep test class, which which performs uh, 
which performs a move operation and then just sees what kinds of things uh, it hits. Uh, so typically, uh, when we when we move the character controller uh, or the capsule representing the character, it's not a single sweep. We actually do it in three motions. We first sweep up and then forward and then down. down. And the reason for doing that is to be able to step over like small bumps uh, or otherwise if we just swept forward we would hit the, a tiny tiny rock and the, uh, the controller would run into that and then it would stop. So we wouldn't be able to run over small rocks or just small ridges in the level. But by sweeping up, forward and then down we can sort of implement stepping. And this also works for running upstairs. Um, there's a lot of kind of fine tuning in the mover to get it to do a reasonable behavior. There are a lot of things we want to want it to slide nicely. When you if you hit the wall at an angle, you should slide and go forward against that angle. If you're running up against the wall, we want to make sure that the mover is stable, that it doesn't like shake back and forth to the wall. There are a lot of little details like that in, in the character controller. And and some, if you're making a, a really a game where you want to take more control over this, it might make sense to go in and, and change some of this behavior in, in our character controller, uh, in addition to what we allow you to, to change with like configuration parameters. Uh, because it's really how the character behaves when it's running around, that's really connected to how the game feels and how the game behaves. You might want to have more detailed control of that. We've tried to make, try to put as much as possible into parameters so you can configure like how steep slopes you can run up and, and, and stuff like that. But, but there might be still be stuff you wanted to, to do in the uh, controller code. Um, rate costs, uh, they look something like this. You specify a ray from position a direction and a length where you cast array, a filter for uh, what objects you should hit, uh, you specify a collision filter flag and also flag whether you should hit static objects or dynamic objects or both. And then you get back a result that is like the position where you hit something, the normal of that hit, and the actor that you hit. And you can uh, you get back a result that is a collection of hits if you if you hit multiple things uh, you can specify either that you want just the first thing that you hit or that you want all the things that the ray hit like passing through objects uh, when you for this ray cost result you can if you want to use a callback if you use a callback uh, that's sort of intended to support asynchronous ray costing so you specify a number of rays with their callbacks and um, the engine will at some later point in time perform the ray costs and then call your callbacks and you will get the results and you can process them. So, and we've exposed this asynchronous interface to the script too. So the script can do asynchronous ray costs too. But <laughs> the sort of um, silly thing about this is that we actually haven't implemented the asynchronous support in the engine. So all the rate costs will still run synchronously right now. Uh, we just have this more complicated asynchronous interface for, uh, for the day in the future where we actually implement asynchronous rate costs. Uh, so this, of course, is a pretty bad situation. Uh, it's kind of bad tricking the users to use this asynchronous interface, thinking they will get more performance and they won't. Uh, so I think this is something we really should look, in, look into, especially since physics allows rate costs to be run on a background thread. Uh, we could sort of allow offload the main thread a bit by allowing rate costs to run asynchronously. Uh, so some, definitely something worth investigating. Um, we also have cloth and vehicle support. I won't say that much more about them. Uh, they interface the cloth and vehicle systems in, in physics. Uh, the cloth implementation is kind of complicated and uh, the main reason for that is that it needs render integration because unlike 
with if you look at the rigid bodies what what comes out of the physics simulation is just a position and rotation that we can apply straightly to the rigid body but when it comes to cloths it becomes more complicated because then it's the position of all the vertices in the cloth and their vertex normals and stuff like that so it needs a more uh, efficient system uh, in order to transfer that into the rendering world and that's what makes it a bit complicated um, we have events in physics that can be triggered for example when two objects collide a physics event is triggered and when that happens uh, the events are put on a queue in the physics so there are some clauses for events uh, they look like this so contact event happens when two objects collide mover actor collision a mover collided with an actor in the game mover mover a mover collided with another mover so these are just structs with a type identifier and we just put them on a on a byte stream just a just a big array of bytes just put put one of these events after another uh, in the physics system so this is again the general system we use for propagating events we just put them in the big buffer in the lower system and then a higher level system pulls this buffer and reacts to the events so in in our case it's the world that does this uh, it has function for uh, for obtaining these events, uh, this queue of events, and then it just goes through them and checks the type and does the right thing for each type of events. Like if it's a contact event, it gets triggered into, into flow eventually by triggering the event on the unit and so on. Uh, um, final physics thing we have is vector fields and that's not actually that's not something that's supported in physics that's kind of our, our own thing uh, and the idea behind vector fields is to have a way to push physics objects around but also things like particles to push them around with winds and explosions and stuff like that to have things happening in the world that that push physics object around and we represent these pushing things as vector fields so a vector field is basically a mathematical thing that means that at each position of the world you have a vector that represents something and in our case it typically represents wind wind velocity uh, so for each the vector field is mathematical structure that specifies the wind velocity at each point in the world and we use wind velocity for everything because wind velocity can represent all these things we want to represent it can represent wind of course but also an explosion an explosion is just air velocity moving out from a particular point like air moving out in all directions from that point is basically what an explosion is uh, so typically we only have one vector field that represents wind velocity uh, but you could imagine there's you can create additional vector fields if you want to if you want like if you want custom gravity if you don't want fixed gravity in your game you want uh, custom gravity pockets with different gra gravity low gravity zones or stuff like that other kind of force fields or uh, force fields or magic maybe you can represent those as vector fields too but typically it's only wind uh, in one of these vector fields representing something a physical property in the world such as wind we play effects and these effects are different isolated things that happen in this in this uh, field in this property field so for wind for example we might have a base wind which is just like the wind blowing through the scene uh, we might have air airflow from a helicopter. You have a helicopter landing. It sort of blows out uh, wind from the from the rotor blades. So then we have an outward blowing effect localized to where the helicopter lands. Uh, explosions. If we have an explosion in a place, we have a localized effect where air flows out from the explosion. Uh, might be the character running around. You might have a little bit of wind sort of streaming out from around where the character is running. 
and so on. Um, so we represent an effect like this with an ASDR envelope. So that's this is from from the synthesizer word. Uh, attacks stands for attack, sustain, decay, release. It basically means that an effect typically has a startup phase where it increases in strength, a plateau phase where it's at a steady strength, and then a fall off phase where it where it goes down. So, uh, so this envelope sort of controls the lifetime of the effect and the strength of the effect during the lifetime. And then there's an expression uh, that express, expresses the effect itself. And this expression expression is some kind of some kind of code, and it's actually written in this vector language that I talked before when I when I in the math talk. So for for an ex, for for an sort of outflowing thing, it might be something like this. This uh, this is a wind of strength ten times uh, the normalized uh, direction between the position and the origin. So it's ten meters per second in the direction. Uh, out from the origin of this effect, so sort of an outflowing air effect, and then there's a fall off. It's divided by the length uh, distance from the from the effect, so it sort of falls off with distance. Uh, but you can write whatever expression you want here. And the way we evaluate this is that each frame we find all the expressions. Uh, and these are compiled into bytecode, as they are for the vector language, this sort of parallel bytecode that I talked about before. So each frame, we take all the expressions from all the currently running effects, and we merge them into a single bytecode, just to be able to run them more efficiently, uh, rather than running a lot, lots of single bytecode, we run a single long bytecode expression. Uh, we also fix the variables that are constant for the frame, so typically, there there are variables in this in these expressions um, uh, that can vary from frame to frame, like the current time, for instance, or or where the origin, maybe the origin of the effect moves around if it's linked to something. So these are variable uh, for the frame, but they are constant. Once in a particular frame, they are constant, and only the position that we are evaluating uh, the vector field at changes. So we lock those variables into constants, and then we can do constant folding to make the bytecode more efficient. Uh, so then we, we will end up with the final bytecode that is merged and constant folded, so it's a more efficient form of the bytecode. And then we can evaluate that bytecode for a number of different positions. So we do that. So to do that for physics, for instance, uh, we find the position of all the physics objects in the world that are affected by the wind. And then we call this in parallel using this parallel bytecode evaluation that I talked about before. And we evaluate in parallel the wind strength at all those positions. And then we apply wind forces to these objects. So we can look at that. So it's something looks it looks something like this. Um, we have our list of all the awake dynamic objects. Um, being awake is kind of an interesting thing in physics ending. Typically, physics ending optimize optimize the simulation by letting objects go to sleep once they are not moving anymore. So if a ball is rolling around, it will be actively simulated until friction makes it stop, then the ball will go to sleep. And when it is, it's at sleep, we don't have to simulate anymore, so we save a lot of processing power. And it will remain asleep until something collides with it, or something pushes it, or some force acts on it, and so on. So when it comes to wind, to, to apply the wind efficiently, we only apply it to awake physics actors, because the thought here is something like, well, if the ball has moved around, uh, for, if there's a wind like blowing through the level, we don't want that wind to keep all physics objects awake at all time, because then we would get horrible performance. So we want the 
wind to sort of blow objects around until they come to rest against something. Like the wind might be blowing in against this object, but it's resting against a rock. Then we want that object to sleep, go to sleep, and not be simulated anymore. Uh, of course, if you have an explosion, uh, if all the objects near the explosion were asleep and we had a big explosion, none of them would move. So when we have an explosion, we explicitly wake the objects close to the explosion and say, wake up, get ready to react to wind. And then we play the wind effect and then all of the objects will, will react to the wind. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is how it's done. We go through all these awake objects, we get their positions, we evaluate the vector field, it will be evaluated in parallel over all these positions, we will get the result back, and then we apply that result uh, based on some uh, air resistance uh, formula. Because wind, is, wind acts on physics objects the same way as air resistance. So uh, if an object falls and, and gets air resistance, that's the same thing as the object being still and air being blown through it uh, at the same speed. So with this, uh, this vector field simulation of wind, we also actually get air resistance into our physics simulation, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah, and the same principle applies for applying wind to cloth and particles. We get a number of positions, we evaluate uh, the wind in parallel, and then apply the wind forces. So that covers most of the physics uh, implementation. I wanted to do a quick overview of some common physics problems, just for orientation, that you can run into. Um, most common one is performance. Physics is running too slow. Uh, so one common cause for that is that you have objects that are awake, even though that, as I talked about before, you really want all objects to go to sleep when they're not moving, so that you're simulating as few objects as possible, because it's a simulation that's expensive. So you really want to make sure that objects fall to sleep. Uh, why could it be that objects aren't falling to sleep? Well, they might be unstable. You might have, um, you might have um, rag dolls that are, are constraints that are trying to sort of pulling against each other all the time. So they they never really fall to rest. Uh, in that case, if, if your objects are unstable, adding some kind of damping or adding more friction is usually a good idea. Um, you might have objects falling out of the world. Uh, so an object might fall through the ground and then it will just continue falling because it doesn't hit anything, it just fall forever. Uh, and that, then of course it will be simulated while it's falling. Uh, and if you have a lot of objects falling out of the world, that can be a problem. So. Uh, taking care to kill the objects that fall out of the world or making sure your ground is solid uh, can be another thing. Uh, another performance problem if, if, is if you use really naive shapes. So the simplest way of making physics shape is just uh, take whatever graphics geometry you have, create a mesh shape for it and just dump it into physics. And that can be really inefficient if you have a really detailed graphics mesh that has like hundreds of thousands of triangles accepting the physics to to sort out the collision for those hundreds of thousands of triangles can be really slowly so making sure that you that you have specific specifically created physics geometry with like fewer three triangles that are easier to simulate can solve that uh, another problem is if you have lots of objects that are moving in physics and typically this arises when you have a lot of characters running around uh, like if you have a game with, say that you have a game with a big multiplayer game, you have 60 characters running around and all those characters have hitboxes for, for collision, like they might have arm hitbox, uh, hand hitbox, uh, head hitbox, it's just maybe like 20 hitboxes for each character running around, then you have 60 of those, then you have like 1200 moving physics objects running around all the time, which can be expensive. So lots of things you can do here. Um, first of all, you should make sure that these limbs uh, that you only really want to ray cost against, you, you don't want to collide with them in physics or something like that. You really only want to use them for ray cost. So make sure that they are only uh, in the query world, that they are not in the simulation world because uh, 
behind the scene, physics ac physics actually has two different words: one for simulation and one for for querying. Uh, so you should make sure that collision is disabled for for limbs like this, so that they only exist in the query world. Uh, another thing you can do is you can use aggregates in physics or multi-box pruning, a more uh, efficient pruning uh, algorithm for this case when you have multiple moving objects. Um, also helps with this situation. Uh, or you could do uh, you could do your own ray cost, you could do your own sort of detail ray costing. Uh, you could do you could use you could put just big capsules for the entire character um, into the physics world and ray cost against that to find uh, candidates for detail ray costing and then you could do detail ray costing against a more more detailed thing that doesn't even have to exist in the physics world so uh, so some ideas there uh, another performance issue might be if you have lots of ray costs overlaps or sweeps and this tends to happen when you write AI objects like in your gameplay code, it's kind of easy to just type out when you're trying to figure out how something should work. Oh, I want a hand grenade. Uh, how should the hand grenade work? Well, this should be like a fragment hand grenade, so it will, sh it will throw out a hundred pieces of fragment. So we just do a hundred ray costs in random directions to see if the hand grenade hits something and uh, stuff like that. Uh, or even more, even more. Uh, Parallels can be, I mean, a hand grenade explodes just in one frame, but you might have things that query stuff uh, all the time. Like you may, may have an AI that's running around and what I want to see if the rate cost can see any other, if this AI can see any other characters, which rate cost from uh, the AI's position uh, to all the other characters to see if it can see them. And it should rate cost against all the limbs because it might be that just the elbow of another character is sticking out behind a shelter and then I want to know if I'm able to see that so I rate cost and if you start doing stuff like that you may end up with thousands of rate costs per frame easily so being frugal about that maybe implement a way of counting how many rate costs you're actually making per frame is useful and consider caching in special situations like we saw with the mover uh, the sweet performance there is really improved by the caching, so uh, consider that for special case scenarios. Um, another common scenario is bullet through paper, uh, which comes from the fact that um, physics engines typically don't simulate the movement of objects. They will just simulate the object in its current position, move it to its position in the next frame, and see if it collides with anything there, and if it does simulate uh, that collision, but it won't simulate the object through every position it moves through. And that can cause objects, small objects can fall, th small objects that are moving fast, if they're on one side of the object in one frame, and on the other side of the object in the other frame, we won't ever detect the collision. So that's usually called a bullet through paper problem, because it happens with fast moving small objects like bullets, when they collide with thin objects like paper. And this can usually be fixed by introducing sweep shapes. So that's a flag that you can set in the physics properties that said that instead of just considering the collision at the start and end positions, we should actually do a sweep test whenever we move the object and see if it collides with anything on the way. And that will deal with those kinds of situations. Uh, another problem that can arise with ragdolls is that uh, you have set up a lot of constraints. Uh, can happen with ragdolls or with long constraint chains and you get some kind of instability like the constraints don't settle properly they're kind of shaking a bit so uh, things to think about is that constraints behave, behave better when the masses are similar of, of all the involved objects uh, so you don't have one super heavy object at the end of a chain of really light objects that's that's usually leads to bad physics behavior uh, you can also consider adding extra constraints when you have a long chain. So instead of having, if you have a ball on a chain, instead of just having constraints between each link of the chain, you can add extra constraints between one link and the link two links from it, a uh, position constraint that limits how far this one can get from that one. And that 
often it's useful for adding stability to these kind of long chains. More damping, also good. Um, another really common problem is that when you have ragdolls spawning inside geometry, so uh, character is running around, it dies. When it dies, one of its limbs is through a wall and the rest of the character is on the other side of the wall. And then you will have this situation where the, the, the constraints will try to pull the character together and you will get lots of violent shaking because there's a wall here in between, so this actor can't pass through the wall, this actor can't pass through the wall, and it will r look really bad and ridiculous. So, I mean, the proper fix against this is don't do this, don't spawn ragdolls inside other geometry. Uh, but that can be easier said than done. And the reason why this happens usually is that usually you want to have parts of the character sticking outside the mover. So the mover is a capsule that controls how the character moves around in the level. And uh, when the character is running around or aiming or doing stuff like that, uh, if the arms will typically stick out of the mover. Uh, the reason for that is that if you made the mover big enough to encompass all the movements of the character arms, then the mover would have to be like, three meters wide which means you, you couldn't walk through a door uh, with your character because you can't walk through a door with both your arms outstretched like this so the compromise is typically you make the mover smaller and you allow the arms to go outside the mover and that makes it possible to go through a, go through a door like this of course if you do your arms will clip through the graphics of the door which kind of looks bad so if you want to want it to look better you need to add extra intelligence as I talked about in the previous lecture uh, in this intersection between AI and animation some sort of interaction where um, the animation is aware of the world and, and sort of pulls in the arms as it goes through the door something like that but um, uh, the connection to ragdolls here is that since arms or legs or whatever can stick outside uh, the controller uh, we can end up a situation where the controller, through the mover system, the controller is always kept so that the controller, the character controller, doesn't intersect with physics. But the arm stretching out of the controller may intersect through a wall. And if we then suddenly turn that arm into a ragdoll, we now have a physics object uh, either through a wall or on the other side of a wall. And then you get this uh, shaking ragdoll. So, so to get rid of this, you, you need some system for making sure that you spawn the ragdolls uh, at a safe place. So maybe you spawn the ragdolls, maybe you do something like a, a sweep cast from, the cent from a safe place, like the center of the character controller that you know isn't penetrating anything. You make a sweep cast from there to where you want to spawn the, uh, the arm. And if that hits something, you spawn the physics object there instead, instead of uh, through the wall. And then maybe you do a blending in the graphics, in the animation, so it actually blends from the uh, from the position here to the actual physics position or you play an animation like when the character dies you first play an animation to sort of bring all the <laughs> limbs into the character controller and then you sim start simulating the ragdoll or s stuff like that there's lots of stuff you could do but this is this is kind of tricky in general and it's hard to find a general solution that looks good in all kinds of games um, Another thing, problem is common, is exploding things. Uh, that typically happens when things are spawned inside other things, like you spawn a couple of balls and some of them happen to penetrate as they are spawned and they will fly apart with tremendous force and it will look really strange. So again, you can avoid this by not spawning things inside other things, which can be tricky. Even, even when setting up a level, it's kind of easy when you're Positioning objects in a level, you might position a position a physics object a bit down in the ground, and then when it's spawned, it will sort of fly out of the ground. Um, it's kind of easy to do that. So another thing you can do in physics is to lower the, the penetration velocity, which is the velocity used to separate objects that are penetrating. And by lowering that a bit, you can you will still get the objects sort of going apart, but it won't be this big explosion where they fly apart. They will sort of separate a bit more. 
slowly, which might look a bit better. Um, there are a lot of other physics issues to consider. One good resource for that is Pierre Turnimont's blog, which is at this address. He discusses a lot of uh, issues like that. Um, any questions on this? Oh, this was a really long talk, I just realized. All right, if there are no questions, thank you very much, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Cheers.